The FBI agent stayed in his bedroom while he dressed, so we had no time to speak with him privately. The internees were transported on trains that were dark with barred windows. A guard armed with a machine gun stood in the rear of each car. As the train traveled north, it picked up other internees who often wept or stared into space as the journey continued. People at this time had fled to America for protection. My father and mother were there. My brothers and sisters were congregated. And we all sat in the kitchen to discuss this dilemma. And if we don't sit down and ask questions and talk about it, we're, we're going to lose our connection to these stories. And these are our stories, and these stories are important. Hi, I'm Danielle Romero, and I'm so glad you're here with me again on my channel, where I've been digging into my family's hidden heritage, my mom's side, Louisiana, and Ireland, and my dad's side is Italian-American. Well, my great-grandpa Francesco came from Italy to New York. I think he came in 1903. Why didn't I learn how to speak Italian? This question took me down a really deep rabbit hole. I found out that during World War II, over 600,000 Italian-Americans who had not yet become citizens were declared, quote, enemy aliens. This label subjected them to a curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., searches of their home, seizures of their property, and exclusion from prohibited zones and restricted areas in California along the coast. But that's not all. Italian-Americans were also at risk of arrest, imprisonment and internment camps, and forced evacuation from their homes. This period in history, I found out, is referred to in the Italian community as una storia segreta. Now, I don't speak Italian, so I'm sure people will let me know in the comments that I totally butchered that, but I am trying. What I've read is that this was a time of secrecy, denial, pain, and humiliation that really lasted for decades in the Italian-American communities. My dad's father, my grandpa Dominic, was the son of Francesco and Elisabetta. They were Italian immigrants who came to the United States, and eventually they were naturalized. I think they were naturalized maybe in 19, by the 1930 census. It looked like Francisco was naturalized before the outbreak of World War II. During World War II, the treatment of Italian Americans in the United States was hostile, to say the least. On June 28, 1940, Congress passed the Alien Registration Act of 1940, otherwise known as the Smith Act, because its chief architect, Howard W. Smith, a representative from Virginia, had spearheaded this. And within four months, four million aliens were registered. Now, it wasn't four million Italians, so we're talking about Japanese German, Italian, these were people on the most wanted list, right, during this time. I want to share a couple quotes I found of people explaining the experience of the government actually coming into their homes because of their ethnicity during this time. We're all sound asleep. My father was in his pajamas. They told him to get dressed as they had orders to take him away. No explanation was given. The FBI agent stayed in his bedroom while he dressed, so we had no time to speak with him privately. They did not even give him time to gather personal effects or toiletries. We were pretty shaken. Several days after his arrest, we learned that my father's office at Rockefeller Plaza had been locked and sealed by the enemy alien custodian, and all of my father's assets were blocked. Initially, the United States supported Mussolini's efforts as he was modernizing Italy, improving the economy and education and transportation system. So in 1937, Mussolini joined the Axis powers, though, which obviously was a cause for concern for the United States. After Italy had declared war on the United States in World War II, Italian Americans rushed to affirm their loyalty to the adopted country. Said, I, I'm, we are American. We are American citizens. A lot of them distanced themselves from their heritage. Some anglicized their names. Propaganda pieces designated foreign languages as the enemy's language. So if you spoke German, Japanese, Italian, and it was seen as suspect. I read one article that Italian-owned businesses would often post signs that said, no Italian spoke here for the remainder of the war. When Britain and France declared war on the Axis powers, President Roosevelt asked the FBI director to make a list of possible enemy agents among the Japanese, Italian, and German immigrants in the U.S. that could be arrested in case of a national emergency. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt issued presidential proclamations, which authorized the U.S. to detain potentially dangerous enemy aliens. Approximately 600,000 Italian-born residents of the United States were declared enemy alien. 
In the weeks following the attack, these enemy aliens were ordered to surrender their cameras, shortwave radios, radio transmitters, flashlights, boats, binoculars, and then any weapons. Enemy aliens were prohibited from traveling outside of a five-mile radius of their home, even for their employment. And they were banned from entering what were considered, quote, strategic areas, such as power stations and airports. Many enemy aliens, Italian-Americans, lost their jobs due to these curfews and travel restrictions. If the family's store or their farm was located in a prohibited zone, who would operate the business? How could a family survive? In California, quote, the, dev the effect was devastating. Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt was the head of the Western Defense Command, and he sought to intern the entire enemy population. He pursued actions that effectively destroyed the economic lives of all Italians on the West Coast, including Joe DiMaggio's family. Joe DiMaggio is a famous baseball player from the New York Yankees. He enlisted in the Army in 1942. Meanwhile, his father, who was a fisherman, was prohibited from his livelihood. Fisherman's Wharf was restricted to Italians where the DiMaggios were prevented from overseeing their own restaurant. Another family from Pittsburgh, California, a woman gave birth to her son in a hospital that was located in a prohibited zone. And her husband, who is a, quote, enemy alien, could not visit her unless he was accompanied by law enforcement. The first time he saw his child, he was in handcuffs, escorted by the police. Because many of these enemy aliens have been living in America for decades, and they had children here, and they, some of them even had grandchildren here. Some of these were refugees who had maybe fled Mussolini's regime. And that is to say, people at this time had fled to America for protection. On February 19th, 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, which authorized the removal of people from specified areas in the interest of national security. AKA, if we're concerned about your ethnicity, we can remove you out of your home at this point. Approximately 10,000 Italian Americans were evacuated from their homes in these restricted zones along the California coast, including the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles. Evacuees were often given very little notice before their forced relocation. In June of 1942, at this point, the FBI had arrested more than 1,500 Italian enemy aliens, and over 400 of these people were deemed dangerous enough to be confined in internment camps. One of those arrested was a man named Filippo Fortalone. His wife was left to care for their three children without any means of support because the family's assets were frozen. The internees were transported on trains that were dark with barred windows. A guard armed with a machine gun stood in the rear of each car. As the train traveled north, it picked up other internees who often wept or stared into space as the journey continued. It was inconceivable to them that the United States, their home of the free, would do this to them. They were innocent until proven guilty, so what crime were they accused of committing? Italian internees were most sent to Fort Missoula in Montana, which they nicknamed uh, the Beautiful View. Other detention camps though existed around the country in New Mexico, Texas, California. Armed guards monitored the internees at all times. When I'm talking, we're talking about internment camps. I'm not trying to make a comparison to the Holocaust. This is obviously not the Holocaust, right? And the camps that they were in were relatively comfortable. We're not, we're not, we're not trying to make a parallel, right, to the Holocaust or to slavery. But just letting this history stand on its own. Fort Missoula was self-sufficient. They had a hospital, a school, a library, a theater, a mess hall, which served Italian and Japanese food because there was a lot of Japanese there too. Internees were often assigned to camp maintenance projects, and some worked on the local farms there. Although the camp routine could be monotonous, they tried to make their best out of the situation by playing baseball and organizing musical entertainment. But nonetheless, they were still prisoners, living their lives on hold, not knowing when they would be released or when they would be re reunited with their families. Thankfully, after exhaustive investigations, there was no evidence of these Italian Americans engaging in subversive activities or posing a threat to national security. In October of 1942, on Columbus Day, Roosevelt removed the enemy alien restrictions from the Italian community. On November 7, 2000, the wartime violation of the Italian American Civil Liberties Act was signed into law by President Clinton. I was 16 years old when this act was signed. And he issued it as a formal apology for the mistreatment of Italian Americans during the war. California actually also issued their own apology in 2010. 
and reaffirmed its commitment to protecting civil rights. To my knowledge, no Italian American has actually filed suit against the United States government for reparations for being interned in these camps. For many, the shame and humiliation even after the war caused irreparable damage to the preservation and transmission of Italian culture, especially the Italian language, to future generations. You know, my dad's grandparents, obviously they spoke Italian because they came over from over there. And my my grandpa, who I grew up with, he spoke Italian, but only to family back in Italy. He would write letters in Italian. The New York State Military Museum sat down and interviewed my grandpa about his experience enlisting in the Navy as a 17-year-old during World War II. He actually left high school to enlist. They were a part of the Italian community. They were a huge part of the Italian Community Center in Troy, New York. I remember being brought there as a teenager. My grandpa would bring me there for dinners and stuff. It was just amazing to me because my grandpa, his first instinct is to enlist in the Navy and go defend America. He died about 15 years ago. I was so lucky to, to be able to find this footage. And so I wanted to share a little bit of him with you. They were patriotic, brave, and they loved America. You got to relive the past. My name is Dominic, and my place of birth is Troy, New York. I was born in 1925. He was a senior in high school, Troy High School. And at that time, quite a few people were, you know, joining the service. And I wanted to join the Navy. A little difficult time with my mother and father. So I just want to stop there. Sorry, it's emotional. I just thought it was interesting when he was saying he had trouble with his mother and father. And I, I don't know the details of that. I don't know if they didn't want him to, to pull out of high school to enroll. I mean, obviously, what parents would want their kid to do that. Or if, it was, if, if his parents were concerned because they were Italian-Americans. And I don't know how they felt about all of that. He consented, and I joined the Navy. In December 7th, 1943, very patriotic. You remember where you were? I was, I was attending a movie. As soon as the movie let out, there was a big gathering out in front of the theater, and everybody was talking about Pearl Harbor. I immediately went home. Father and mother were there, and my brothers and sisters were congregated, and we all sat in the kitchen to discuss this dilemma. And I can recall my brothers saying this war is going to be over in six months. I didn't disagree with him because I didn't know much about the politics or the history that was behind it. Wow, I, I, I feel like I really did not value sitting down and listening to my grandparents as much as I should have. Now I feel like there's so much history in our communities, all these different communities, and if we don't sit down and ask questions and talk about it, we're going to lose our connection to these stories. And these are our stories. And these stories are important. You know, when he left high school to go do this. And his brothers were in the army. And they went to defend their country. I know that they're really proud of their Italian heritage, but they saw America as their country. This was recent, you know. And, and if you've been on my channel and you've kind of seen me dive into my mom's side of the family where I have African-American heritage, you know, enslaved ancestors and kind of trailing their stories through time down in Louisiana and even back to Africa. And that's important. And I think that needs to be talked about. But this was 1940. Like, it's insane. It's outrageous. There are people alive today who remember their parents being pulled out of their houses and, and detained for being Italian. Uh, a couple of comments here and there about this idea of like, this is just an attempt to get a victim card. No, it's not. This is history. This is our history. We can't be expected to do better when we don't know what we're coming from and who who we are and how our people have persevered through things. And I'm talking about all different kinds of people that have persevered through all different kinds of things. And so it's not about being negative and it's not about just telling the the bad stuff. The idea I reject is that telling history and sharing history is a political maneuver. I have no agenda at all. I'm not being sponsored by anybody at all. I love history. I don't believe that history is something to be weaponized against each other. But I also don't think that we should sweep things under the rug because we're afraid about how researching it will come off or how will be perceived. Let me know if you knew about this. If you'd like to read more about it, I will link below to some of the sources that I pulled from. Thank you for being with me as I am learning about my family history here in America.